Okay, today we are continuing with the Magdokya Upanishad. Last week we did a little introduction to this text, this scripture, which is one of the finest Vedantic scriptures and universal scripture, which is uh, very ancient from the Atharveda and it is one of the most important scriptures of our tradition and this is probably the only scripture that explains the meaning of Om. As I mentioned, Om is a composite of three sounds, a, u, and ma. Om becomes one syllable, <clears throat> one undivided syllable. This scripture explains that a stands for the waking state, u for the dreaming state, and ma for the state of deep sleep. It's just a random sort of connection between these three states. There is no particular reason why it is put like that, other than that this sound, Om, is heard in deep meditation. This is a universal experience. In deep meditation, sages throughout the world Seers throughout the world have heard this universal sound. We are at verse 3, which explains the very first state, the waking state. I'm reading verse 3. The first aspect is the waking state, Vashvanara. In this state, consciousness is turned to the external with its seven instruments and 19 channels. It experiences the gross phenomenal world. What exactly is the waking state? This, what is happening right now, is the waking state. All of you are listening to my voice, you're seeing the verses, you're reading these verses, you're sitting in different parts of the world and there where you're sitting, all around you, if you look around you right now, you will see in your room, a table, chairs, if you look out, you will see maybe trees, maybe a road, maybe buildings. You have around you walls. Everything that you see around you, this right now is the waking state. And your experience of this is the waking state. Your consciousness is external right now. You're paying attention to the world around you, you're, you're more or less present in this external reality. To understand this a little deeper, we need to understand how we experience this waking reality, this here, this now. We experience it with the help of seven instruments and 19 channels. This sounds complicated. It is not. I will explain it. Most important to understand is that this is not mere theory. This is something that you can relate to in your daily life with the right attitude. The seven instruments are earth, water, fire, air, 
space and the breath, which is made up of apana and pra prana and apana, which is inhalation and exhalation. Now, earth, water, fire, air, space, these elements are not quite like we may understand it from a modern aspect. In the modern sense, we just think of earth as, as you know, some, some mud or dirt. Water, we think in terms of this transparent uh, liquid that we drink. Fire is something that burns. Air is something that we breathe. And space is probably uh, just everything. Or we even think of outer space when we think of space. This is not exactly how we understand it from a yogic perspective. From a yogic perspective, from a meditative perspective, this is slightly different. To help you understand this, just imagine that you have an apple. An apple is a beautiful uh, red or green fruit. And let's take a green apple. Imagine you have a green apple. It's a nice, shiny, juicy apple. And you see this apple. The apple has some substance. It's got matter. That hard matter, that substance, is the quality of earth. Now imagine you chew or bite into this apple and you chew it. And this juicy apple in your mouth is maybe tasting a little bit sour. It's a green apple, so it maybe is a bit sour. And that is the water aspect of the apple, the taste and the juice of it. That's the water aspect. You can taste it. What is the fire element? The fire is the fact that it's, it's got this amazing green color. It's got a beautiful, bright green color. And that green color, that's the element of fire. This is seeing something. So this is the fire element. Then the taste, uh, then the air element is when you're chewing on this apple, it's a crunching sound that you make when you take a big bite and you make a crunching sound. That's air because sound is, travels through air and that's air. And this apple exists in space. So you see any object around you, perhaps you're sitting there comfortably drinking a cup of tea. You can take the cup in your hand and you see it has the same elements. If you look at your cup and maybe you have a blue cup and that's a hard cup, you feel it. It's blue, it has the element of fire. Maybe makes a sound if you click on, you know, you tap on it. And it occupies space. So everything around you has these elements. And you can say, oh my cup, um, what about the water aspect? I, I don't taste my cup. No, you don't taste your cup, but it does have some sort of taste. The cup itself, that's probably why babies and little infants, they like to put things in their mouth, you know. The reason they're doing that is they're exploring, they're studying that object. So you study these objects around you and you see that they have all these elements. A slightly subtler aspect of understanding this reality is then your breath. Your body too is made up 
of these five elements. So as you will, you will draw a little bit inwards, you're not now with the tables and the chairs and the, and the cups and the books and the laptops. You observe that your body too has some matter. That's earth. It's got water. It's got fire. It's got air and it occupies space. It's got all these elements. And the subtler aspect of this, a slightly subtler, is the exhalation and the inhalation, <coughs> which is a bridge to the mind, to the more internal part of yourself. So the reality is made up of these things. And now we understand it through 19 channels. What are these 19 channels? A channel is a, is a way to, to give information and to take in information. That's where you say you have a channel to somebody. You know, it's an information channel. So you put out information and you receive information through these channels. So what are these 19 channels? The first parts are the karma indriyas, that is the active senses, then the five cognitive senses, the five vayus, that makes it 15, and the four parts of the antakarna, that makes 19. If I leave it at this, it may remain intellectual, so I would like to explain how these senses interact with the world. The five karma indriyas are speech is one of them, locomotion or movement is the second, grasping is the third, reproduction is the fourth, and elimination is the fifth. We use these five to interact with the world around us. Right now I am speaking to you. As I'm speaking, you don't see it, but I move my hands, I move my face, have expressions. Any person, when speaking, also moves. Imagine somebody would speak to you in a very stiff manner, without any movement. It appears, in, you know, not very human. It's, it's like a robot or a machine talking, without emotions. And most of our communication is through the body the unconscious level. <clears throat> so you see the connection between speaking and movement, between speaking and locomotion. <clears throat> Sorry. So there's <clears throat> a deep connection between the indriyas. And this, this is, <clears throat> sorry, karma indriyas are a way to put out information. But how do we receive the information? We receive the information or take in knowledge through the cognitive senses or the jhana indriyas. So if somebody speaks like I am speaking, you are listening. That's a cognitive sense or a jhana indriya. We communicate through touch as well. We, we take in information. For example, by touching the apple, we felt its smooth texture. And that was an information we acquired. If the texture would not have been smooth, but would have been very rough, you would have felt this apple is dry, it's old, it's not fresh. So you received some 
knowledge out of that. When you tasted the apple, you also received some knowledge. When you saw the apple, you saw it's a green apple and not a red apple. It was also information that you received. You smelled the apple and it had a nice fruity smell. And that made it somehow more tasty. If you have an apple which doesn't smell good, it probably doesn't even taste good. So you see how these senses work together. When you start seeing how the active senses and the cognitive senses work together, it's a very fascinating process because you're observing reality and how you are taking in that information and bringing it out. You're observing the relationships between these parts of reality and, and the way you receive the information. The values are part of the body and they're a functional part of the energies moving in the body. Anantakarna is the four aspects that receive this information from the reality around us. So manas is the one that coordinates the information. Think of it like a computer. There's input, you put in data, you type in something and that information then is in your computer and then through the screen you get some information back. So there's an interface. Similarly, there's something like an interface which is manas. It's an in-between. It coordinates the information which comes in and which goes out. Then there's ahankara. Ahankara is that part that believes he or she is the one. He is identifying with the person who thinks, I, I, this is me, I am. <clears throat> it's the identity that you adopt. Chitta is where all this is stored. All the information that comes in has to be stored. And so there are memories, thoughts, feelings, emotions, all this is in chitta. And then finally there's buddhi, which is that finest wisdom in you. Which talks to you sometimes and tells you what you should do, but you don't do it. <laughs> <clears throat> so this was <clears throat> how reality operates. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a slight little sore throat today. <clears throat> All right. So, reality is operating through the seven instruments and 19 channels. Please remember that this should not remain intellectual, but you can observe these in your waking state. You can take up one of these, such as cognitive sense or one of the active senses, and observe these during your daily life, and you will find it quite fascinating to see how it works. So you become more and more aware of, of the sense of touch or of, of, of locomotion or of your speech or of listening. You begin to study, actually you begin to study the waking reality and how you are operating in this waking reality. This 
consciousness, so the one who is perceiving this waking state, at that point of time, right now, is turned outwards. We're looking out into the, con into the phenomenal world. We're looking out into the world that is around us. Wherever you are, in your room, or somewhere out in a cafe, or wherever you may be, you're looking around you, and your consciousness is turned to outwards. This is the waking reality. This is how it's described. Is that good? Was that um, easy to follow? Are there any questions about this? Radhika Ji? Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm interested in knowing, and it's possible that I, I, I missed it. Mm -hmm. it, it you, or could you comment on the, the sense of time, or maybe it was covered somewhere in the channels? The sense of time we will do in the next verse, in the uh, okay. verse on dreaming. And you will see that right now in the waking state, we are bound by time, but that changes in the dream state where we are freed from this. Time is purely a, a, a concept that we have created. Because in this waking reality, we are bound by it. For example, we are bound by... Before, before watches and clocks were in, was invented, we still had time. So time has nothing to do with, with the watch, you know, with the clock. The concept of time was earlier, came from nature, through the cycles of day and night, through the seasons that we went through. So as day turned into night, you had lunar cycle which created a month. You had the solar cycle that created a year with all the four seasons or six seasons. And that gave a sense of time. And we were bound by this. But in the dream state, that disappears. So we will go to that in the next, next level. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, thoughts, questions? Okay, good. Then we go to the dream state. This is a very fascinating subject. I'm sure there will be questions about this. I'll go ahead and read the verse first. Verse 4. The second aspect is the dreaming state, Tejasa. In this state, consciousness is turned inward. It also has seven instruments and 19 channels, which experience the subtle mental impressions. So, just as the waking state was a state of consciousness, the dreaming state is also a state of consciousness. Here, the consciousness is turned inward. It's not outwards, but inwards. At night, generally at night, you go to bed, you lay down, you close your eyes, and then the external world around you disappears. You are no longer aware that you are sleeping on the bed, that there is a room around you, and maybe next to you your partner is sleeping, maybe in your next room your children are sleeping. You lose awareness of all this 
waking reality, all this gross world of objects. Your consciousness is turned inwards. Yet, it says, this consciousness also has seven instruments and 19 channels. So once again, you have the same seven instruments and 19 channels. So what's the difference between the waking state and the dream state? The only difference seems to be that one reality is external, the other reality is internal. Instead of taking the apple, a real apple, we have a dream apple. Imagine you're dreaming about the apple. What happens when you're dreaming about the apple? You see the apple. It has a dream substance to it. In that dream, it has some sort of matter. It seems so real. When you bite the dream person, that is you, are dreaming about it, the dream person now bites into the dream apple and has a dream taste. <laughs> and that is the element of water. This dream apple has a beautiful green color. It has a texture that, that was earth and this green color is fire. And now the dream person is crunching into this dream apple and you hear, in your dream, you hear the sound. That's air. And all this is happening in a dream space. So all this is, is possible even in the dream state. Similarly, you, you need all these karma indriyas. You speak in your dream, you move in your dream. You have all this even in your dream. In your dream, you hear things, you touch things, you see things, you taste and smell things. So this dream reality has all of this as well. The same seven instruments and 19 channels are now turned inwards. So what's the difference? between the waking reality and the dreaming reality. Nothing really. In our dream, when you're having a dream, you're, you're so convinced that it's real. If you have a dream that somebody a, 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 an aggressive dog is chasing you, you know, it wants to bite you, and this dog is chasing you, you're going to be terrified and you're going to be running, and that fear is real. There is one major difference in dream reality, which is different from waking. In waking reality, there seems to be a certain order. Things seem to have a, have a kind of a linear way of following, you know. There seems to be a certain order. Because Ankara it's like a filter. All the impressions are filtered through Ankara. This kind of functioning of our waking reality, we call it secondary, func secondary process functioning. But dream reality, as you all know, is not very linear. 
you could be chased by a dog and the next moment you're relaxing in your garden munching on an apple and then you're off flying in the air and next thing you know you're falling from a mountain there is absolutely no linearity there's no filter and this reality is not limited by the laws of physics there's no sense of time there's no no laws binding you here so this dream reality is a place where you can actually do whatever you like and so what we cannot do in our waking reality we do in the dreaming reality those desires that we cannot fulfill in our waking state we can fulfill in our dream state or can we do you think we can fulfill them can we live them out can we play with these desires If I want to have a cake and if I don't eat a real cake or chocolate but I have in my dreams a chocolate will I be satisfied generally not I mean even if you eat the chocolate in your dream all that might happen is that you get up having a very strong desire to have chocolate because the desire was there and eating a dream chocolate does not quite satisfy the desire to satisfy the desire we need to bring the desire up into the waking state that is what we do in deep meditation or in dhyana we learn to bring the dream state up into the waking state What does it mean to bring the dream state up into the waking state? Some of us may get up in the morning and you remember a dream. You remember having seen a dream about an apple, about a green apple. Is this what I'm talking about? Is that what you do in meditation? Some people write dream diaries. They get up in the morning and the first thing they do is write down whatever they could remember. By doing this, they became they become more aware of what they have been dreaming about. They start remembering more and more dreams. You can do that. Some of you if you like, you can write a dream diary in the mornings. and you will see initially you may not remember much but as you keep doing it you will remember more and more of your dreams but then what do you remember the dream after it happened not while it was happening that's two different things
can you be aware during your dream? That's one aspect of greater awareness. And the next and the finest way of integrating the dream state into the waking state is during dhyana when you allow the dream state to come forward into your waking state during meditation you're not sleeping you're not in bed you're sitting at your seat and allowing the dream state to come forward Does that make sense? Anybody likes to comment on this or ask questions about this? Hello. Yeah. Sometimes when I wake up from a dream, let's say after having seen my dead grandmother or something, mm. there is the sense of happiness that you know that flows through that state, flows through the day. Does it kind of imply that a part of that desire of me wanting to see my grandmother was kind of satisfied in the dream, or because it seems like there is an impact on it on the day too? I'm like a little bit happy when I wake up. I'm happier through the day when these happy stuff happen in the dreams. So. Hmm. That, that's an interesting comment because when I think of my father who's passed away and if I if I dr dream about him and when I get up, I, I don't, frankly, I don't feel happy. I feel sad. So that might be purely um, your perception or how you look at it. Radhika Ji? Yeah, sure, Manisha. I couldn't really hear uh, what Krishna was saying. Yeah, um, he was wondering if there was a relationship between the dream and something, his his mood during the day. And, uh, okay. and, and I said, yes, it, it just depends on how you perceive uh, your dream. If you've had a a frightening dream, you may feel a little sort of disturbed or sh shaken up during the day because you you remember this dream which was frightening. If you had a pleasurable dream and you get up in the morning and you think about it, you remember it, then you may feel good during the day. So, um, but yes, that, that, that's just... Um, kind of an obvious kind of statement to make. Good, is everybody pretty okay about it? Or did you have something, Manisha? Yeah, I just, uh, I thought that you highlighted sort of these three um, areas of dreaming or gradually bringing it into the awareness. So the mm. second one I think of is lucid dreaming. Mm. But the third thing you were talking about um, in your sitting meditation or however one might go about it, could you just talk a little bit more about that? Mm. If you can't, can't, maybe not. But <laughs> Yeah, lucid dreaming actually since you mentioned it, um, what what you were referring to as my second point, or what I call my second it's point. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when uh, I'm talking about just being 
aware during a dream. What okay. what is being kind of called lucid dreaming by various people these days is wanting to control, having a sense of control during dreams. According to this scripture and according to sages who have mastered these stages of, of waking, dreaming and deep sleep, you cannot control your dream state. You cannot manipulate your dreams. If you manipulate your dream, it's not a dream anymore. It's, um, it's a visualization. You can visualize something where uh, I can visualize becoming uh, Miss Universe, you know? And if you say, I, I visualize becoming Miss Universe in my dream, then it's not a dream, then it's simply visualization. Dream is that which comes forward from the unconscious mind. And these are basically your desires and samskaras that are playing out. It's a playground. The dream state is a playground. For those things that you cannot play within the waking state. So for most women who are not going to become Miss Universe, they can either visualize it in the waking state or if that desire is very strong, they may find themselves dreaming about it, but it would be unconscious. There's no control in there. They may be aware, if they're slightly more aware, you may be aware that you're having a dream about becoming Miss Universe because that is a deep desire. But you cannot control it. You cannot manipulate it. Now, you can allow this whole thing to come forward in your meditation. Now, there's, of course, certain limitations in explaining that because this is an entire process which... The student goes through systematically, gradually, over years of training. So you would learn, in our tradition, we learn to do this. You learn to observe your senses. You learn to observe the antakarna, which is manas, ankara, buddhi and chitta. You learn to become aware of the waking state and then also of the dream state. When I say becoming aware of the waking state, you may be surprised by that. But the fact is that most of us are not fully aware even of the waking state. While we are talking, you may have certain thoughts in your mind that you're not fully conscious of. So when I mentioned having a dream about Miss Universe or a desire about wanting to become Miss Universe, maybe some of you had a thought or an image which was related to that or not could be something else. Maybe it was something totally off because you, you thought, oh, totally off, you know. If you're, if you were a male, you're a male person and you're not thinking about Miss Universe, maybe you thought about something completely different. Maybe you thought about of having a, a Ferrari or a Porsche and driving around in this, in this cool car and becoming you know, a very, very rich person. So maybe you had a completely different thought. But how aware were you during the waking state of that thought, of that image? So you see, even during our waking state, we are not fully aware. So through that process of dhyana, which goes from gross to subtle, you become more aware of your own waking state. As you become 
more aware of your waking state. It sort of expands. And this awareness starts spilling over into the dream state. You become more aware of your dreams. And then these dreams sort of bubble forward or bubble up into your waking state. There are people who actually are doing this, but they're doing this even unconsciously. For example, those of us who are suffering from some sort of psychosis. For these people, it's very natural that they are walking around sort of floating uh, with you know, thoughts and ideas which are coming from the unconscious mind. You will see them, you know, um, walking around in a kind of haze. It's a bit like hallucinating in the daytime and walking around in your hallucinations. So such people are suffering because they are deeply attached to all these images that come up. They don't have a distance to it. So the dream state is coming up in the waking reality, but that's not what the yogis mean. Because that state of a person who is suffering from a form of psychosis is a tamasic state. A yogic state is very sattvic. And it's sattvic because the yogi allows these things to consciously come forward at will. He can do it whenever he wants. And he allows them to come forward and witnesses them. He does not fall into them, get involved and suffer. In fact, he observes it just like you would observe or watch a movie or a drama and it would not interfere with his daily life. A person who is suffering from some forms of psychosis where this dream state is coming forward unfiltered is suffering, has no control, is not conscious and it's not on command. He cannot or she cannot stop it. And that is the difference between the two. So, allowing the dream state to come forward in your meditation requires a certain degree of mastery and practice. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions about the dream state or waking state or related question? As I mentioned, the dream state is the playground for our desires, for the samskaras. And when you dream about eating chocolate at night, you're dreaming in your sleep, you're not conscious. That dream does not satisfy you. You don't feel satisfied. You may have to get up and go get yourself some chocolate at midnight because you had a dream about chocolate. So the desire is fulfilled only in the waking state. Then the desire is really fulfilled. What the yogis do or what master meditator does is he allows or she allows the dream state to come forward as I already explained and he or she would see the desire for chocolate and now the difference is that when he sees the desire for chocolate and in that meditation is able to observe it, 
and let it go, then he does not have to physically go and eat the chocolate. That is because the desire for chocolate and the idea of eating the chocolate came into the waking state. While physical manifestation is, a, is clear that, that that desire has been fulfilled, this is another way of fulfilling desires, and this is the yogic way. And this leads to vairagya. This is how you burn up samskaras. Any questions? So, Survi, how's everything going? Do you have any questions, Survi? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, Gautam, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, actually, two questions. Let me ask the first question. So, if I've understood this, uh, the last part, so when there is a desire or there's a vasana, so becoming aware of the vasana is actually uh, the, uh, it's consuming the vasana. And, uh, is that what it is? That once you become aware of it in the dream state, then it is, uh, you have experienced it? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, of course, it de depends on the degree of awareness. The uh, the absolute awareness, as I said, the waking awareness also is not a hundred percent. You are listening to me very carefully, so you are paying attention. But while you're listening to me, you're not aware completely of the traffic behind you. You know, you're sort of semi-aware of it, right? Because the mind sort of learns to ignore that, right? So, yeah. the vasana is similar. If it comes forward with this kind of awareness, which is so 100% that you're really paying attention, then it has a capa that's a, there's a possibility that it goes, you know, it's consumed, as you put it, a good word, it's consumed, it's put in the fire, it's consumed, and we call it a, like a roasted seed. The seed is there, but it has no power to germinate. So nothing comes out of it. There's, it doesn't affect you in your daily life anymore. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking, is there a state between the dreaming state and the waking state? And the reason I'm asking this is... Uh, uh, at times we could be uh, dreaming and also uh, murmuring something or there are times when uh, there are cases of uh, people doing sleepwalking. I have actually myself done some sleepwalking when mm -hmm. I was a child. So what mm -hmm. kind of a state is this uh, neither dreaming nor waking? Yeah, well, <clears throat> sleepwalking is actually just sleeping uh, or dreaming, whatever you're doing at that point of time. You're not in deep sleep, you're in, in dreaming state. But only you have, uh, normally the, the muscles are sort of so relaxed that you cannot move. You cannot, you cannot walk. But there seems to be sometimes a, a little hiccup there. And so you can move around. But the question you asked was a good one. Is there a state between waking and dreaming? Yes, there is a state. And it's a transition state. And if people want to give it a label, it is called unmani. It's called unmani avastha. That means you are not really paying attention. You know, unmani is somebody who is, you know, you're just doing something, but you're not really paying attention. It's a bit like that. And from that state, you, you fall asleep. We experience this every night. If you observe carefully, when you go to sleep at night, you're falling asleep. You may notice, you may notice, oh, oh, I'm falling asleep now. I'm, I'm falling into this kind of black hole, you know. 
and then suddenly the first little dream image might come up. You might just watch it before you lose consciousness. And that's somewhere there. That is called Unmani Avastha. So it's a transition state between waking and dreaming. There's another transition state between dreaming and deep sleep. But, but we will discuss that later when we come to deep sleep. But these transitions are very important. When you are able to observe these transitions, you will get some really good insights. You can observe in the morning as well the transition from dreaming into waking. You will also see the same process over there. Was that okay, Gautam? Did that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So, Suruvi, do you have something to say or add? Um, this means that like our whole life uh, should be a meditation, should be like meditation, like expanding our awareness from uh, meditation to our daily lives. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking about okay, the question. <laughs> I was not gone away. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> okay. like from what I understood, uh, I may be wrong, but like uh, from what you said, uh, what I get uh, is that like our whole life uh, the, you know daily mundane things and uh, everything we do we should do it with full awareness mm -hmm. yes. like same uh, like in meditation we uh, try to remain aware of our breath breath and uh, like same awareness we should expand it, uh, it in our daily lives by doing you know uh, whatever we are doing at the moment mm -hmm. so this means like our whole life should be a sort of meditation is this like what you mean? Yes and no. Uh, yes, because that's where you want to go. And no, because it's going to be difficult to pull off. So the process of meditation, which is taking you from gross to subtle, helps you gain mastery over the waking state by helping you become more observant. And as you observe all these elements around you. You observe your breathing, you observe the active senses, you observe the cognitive senses, you observe the antakarna. You're observing everything. As you're observing everything, you become more aware. Your awareness expands. It expands into the dreaming state, which then comes up into your waking state. And yes, then you're getting there. You're getting there to where whole of life becomes meditation. But that's not what you should do. It, it should not become what most people end up doing, and which is a big mistake, is they think, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to be completely aware. Um, Subhadra, could you please mute because we're getting some background sound from you? Thank you. So... If you say we should do this, we should make whole of life a meditation, what happens is that you're trying to force yourself to do something that you really cannot. Your, your consciousness has not expanded as yet. You first need to learn to observe all these things around you, become more aware, and allow the consciousness to expand. And when that happens, effortlessly, then you are really getting somewhere. But when it is forced, it's not real meditation. Anything that's forced, where there's effort, is not real meditation. That is preparation for meditation, or attempting to meditate, or getting there. So there's effort involved. So that's why I said yes and no. You want to go there, but... There has to be a systematic approach. A lot of people, and there are these new Advaitites, they, they do this, 
they think if I am in the now, you know, I'm the present, I'm in the now. But how many people can hold that awareness in the now? How long can you do this? I'm going to observe everything and you keep looking here and there. And how long can you do that? A few minutes for, for, for a short while. And that's all. After that, you lose your awareness. Because first, you need to train that awareness in, in your meditation seat. And only then, it starts spilling okay. over into your daily life. Okay? Okay, okay so like we should not force it like... Uh... Till uh, like till natural like till naturally when I can become aware of what I'm doing, mm -hmm. uh, that till that time I should remain aware. Other times like I should let you know like uh, let it flow. Yes, yeah, just do what you're doing. I mean, just let it okay. be. Yes, but that was a good question. Okay. Yeah, good question. Okay, thank you. Very practical question related to daily life, and that's very useful. Thank you for the question. So the hour is up and we can stop here. It's a good place to stop because the next verses are about Praja. Prajna is deep sleep. And so we will continue uh, this at the next uh, Friday. And I wish everybody a nice weekend. Bye everyone. Bye. Goodbye everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Come. Bye. 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 Bye.